Hi, my name is Dr. Olani Edward Nguenya, and we continue with our plastic surgery podcasts. Herein, we will be discussing gynecomastia. We still remain within the series of breasts, um, and in this talk, we will be addressing male pathology, um, specifically <clears throat> the most common um, condition that males will present with to the plastic surgeon, which is gynecomastia. So <clears throat> let's just go through gynecomastia, define what it is, speak about the etiology thereof, we'll classify it, and remember whenever you classify something, you classify in order to manage. So the classification, if not anatomically mainly, is actually to guide your management plan. And so we'll then speak about how we manage um, gynecomastia. As I always repeat, this does not aim to replace your learning but merely to augment and supplement that which is already there so i still encourage you to go and read the details in your textbooks read articles about gynecomastia now, let's speak about it now what is gynecomastia um basically what gynecomastia is as per a a a, a simple definition is just benign proliferation of glandular tissue in the male breast that's all it is so just proliferation, or you can say it's excessive male breast development. Now, you've got to be able to differentiate this from lipomastia, or another word for lipomastia, pseudo-gynecomastia. And herein, you will get excessive development of the main breast, but from where? From sub fat deposition, without glandular proliferation that's what differentiates it so it's just um development of the male breast from the sub areola what fat deposition but not glandular proliferation which is what gynecomastia is something very common in fact it is the most common breast problem in males um and generally males in their lifetime will experience some degree of gynecomastia but um you know as per the reporting and the incidents we don't have really that much um what is a male normal breast anatomy something that maybe you should be able to to identify um the normal areola dimension is generally two to four centimeters um and on average the um, external notch to the um, in nipple areola complex is about 20 centimeters. Others would say 19, but on average 20 centimeters. But you may use also other measurements um, that we use. How do we assess the normal position? Usually from the sternal um, or midclavicular line um, or about eight centimeters from the sternal notch, the, the clavicle midclavicular line it's generally 18 centimeters from that. Sternal notch, we've mentioned 19 to 20. The internipple positions, generally 21. Where also can you, what can you use to identify the nipple? There's also the lateral board of the inferior pectoral um, pet major muscle is something that you can use. You can also use the humerus. It's usually at the mid humeral height. And then there are certain other equations which you know, are generally complex and they, um, I mean, one of them you would, you would, you would measure your height and then you times it by 0 0.772 to give you the nipple height of where it should be. And then the position, then you go further, you now measure the circumference, etc. So there are many equations, but um, those are just the normal positions of where you'd want your nipple to be. So when we assess a patient who comes in with gynecomastia, we are going to assess that. We're assessing the projection. We're assessing the excess parenchyma. Then we assess the skin envelope in itself. We assess the nipple areola complex, um, its position and um, its size. And then further, and last but not least, we want to see if there's any degree of ptosis. Now, this is on a systemic level. So what causes a gynecomastia? Um, and remember, when you have a patient coming in with gynecomastia, you need to be able to exclude other things such as 
Um, we've spoken about pseudogynecomastia, um, diabetic mastopathy, um, a lipoma, maybe an, another thing, or lyomyoma, um, but of significance and what we should never forget and we should always strive to exclude is breast cancer. And we always forget this, but breast cancer, you know, uh, males can get breast cancer too. In fact, there is a 1% chance, um, you know, um, incidence of, of breast cancer within males. And generally, we detect those in the late, you know, um, the later years, the sixth, year, the sixth decade of life, around 65. And the reason being, number one is presentation. But also, um, you know, there's, there's, there's other theories that go into that. Um, and generally, it's no different to female breast. You still take the same history. You check for, you know, um, family history, which is significant, not just of breast cancer, but of any other cancers in the family. Um, you want to know about, you know, genetic predisposition, your brachas, one, two, Kleinfelter syndrome, cryptokinism, orchitis, you know, radiation exposure. Um, are there any steroids that the patient has been taking exogenously? And all those things just to, to, to give you a diagnosis. But remember, triple assessment remains. We do, which is a history. And then we do our mammogram, um, which is 90% sensitive, actually, of picking up any lesions and no different um, to a female. And, 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 and after we do that, we then will do a biopsy and we'll manage accordingly. But this is not the brief, but I just thought it's important for us to be able to differentiate um, or diagnose male breast cancer. And we should always think about it. Um, and the, 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 the things that can predispose one specifically, um, you know, the Kleinfelter's disease or Kleinfelter's syndrome, because the risk for malignant transformation actually increases to 60 folds, um, you know, from one to 1,000 to, to one in 400, um, who would get that. Okay. So let's, 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 let's go back to gynecomastia, the etiology. The way I would like you to divide your etiology is in four parts. <clears throat> One, you would either say it's idiopathic. And of course, that would be the last diagnosis, the diagnosis of exclusion. In fact, it is the most common idiopathic um, as a cause. We just don't know. Two, it can be physiological. Three, it can be pathological. And then four, the causes may be pharmacological, all right, or a combination therein. Now, let's go deeper into those. Idiopathic, um, physiological, pathological, pharmacological. So we've clarified idiopathic. Now let's go to physiological. What are the causes physiologically that may, 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 may give you, you know, gynecomastia? Well, there are three phases in a man's life. The neonate, a man has a neonate, the neonatal phase, the, 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 the stage when he hits puberty, and now an elderly patient in regards to gynecomastia. As a neonate, due to the circulating maternal estrogen via the placenta, the child's breast may be physiologically enlarged male, and that's a neonatal physiological etiology for gynecomastia. As one enters puberty, there may be a relative excess of plasma estradiol versus um, testosterone. So if there's a balance mismatch, call it, and we have an excess in estrogen, then we would then have um, a physiological etiology for gynecomastia. And then the elderly, of course, because of two things. Number one, there's a decrease in circulation um, of testosterone because testosterone goes down, but estrogen goes up. So the, the peripheral aromatization of testosterone then happens to estrogen because of that. Now, pathologically, it's then the big group. And what can be wrong pathologically? And what can cause gynecomastia? 
Well, simply remember we spoke about hormones. So it can be anything that increases serum estrogen or anything that decreases testosterone synthesis. Or it can be miscellaneous. Now, anything that increases serum estrogen, how do we divide it into four groups? We divide it. Number one, the, the things that will cause you to have a high level of estrogen is number one, increase in endogenous production, or there's an exogenous source, or there's increase in aromatization, or there's a decrease in the metabolism of the normal circulating estrogen. So estrogen can be raised from endogenous production, such as with, you know, the, your lady, Hosatoli cell tumors, adrenocortical um, tumors, you know, HCG secreting tumors, etc. Or it can be increased from exogenous intake, such as oral contraceptive ingestion, topical estrogen creams, etc. Or there may be an issue with aromatization, the conversion therein, such as in a normal patient who's aging. But do not forget obesity. Do not forget refeeding after starvation or patients with hyperthyroidism. But obesity is one big group that comes in here. Or we've got normal estrogen, but the levels are high. Why are they high? Not because of increased productions, but they are just not being broken down, being metabolized, such as in patients with liver cirrhosis. And then we have situations where we've got decreased testosterone synthesis. Now, what will decrease our synthesis of testosterone? Number one, you may just have, it may be either primary or secondary. What do we mean by primary? Primary, it may be an issue of decreased gonadal failure. So secondary to trauma, drugs, radiation, client filters, congenital, um, anosia, whatever it is, um, this is primary gonadal failure. So the gonads themselves primarily fail and don't produce testosterone. Or it can come as a secondary um, a cause from, you know, a hypothalamic disease or pituitary failure or Coleman syndrome. So because of that negative feedback, um, we then have decrease um, in testosterone synthesis. Another issue may just be the receptors that we've got testosterone. However, there's decrease in androgen um, action because of androgen receptor defects or antiandrogens that the patient may be taking. There are, of course, other miscellaneous causes such as liver disease, chronic renal failure, HIV, and the, the treatment thereof, chronic illnesses, and then other things which have been noted such as, you know, from an environmental perspective, um, such as lavender and tea, tree oil are some of the things that have been mentioned. The last big group then is the pharmacological group. And this is broad. I mean, it's almost sure. Anything that you can throw in the from hormones um, such as estrogen, growth factors, anabolic steroids, from you know to NE anti androgens um, such as um, diabetes, hypertensive medication like spironolactone, you know, and um, antibiotics. There's certain antibiotics like metronidazole, isoniazide, you know, ketoconazole. Um, all those things can cause that. anti alpha medication is another group. Your PPIs, your anetidines, your misometidines, um, even chemotherapy like your alkalytic agents, your methotrexate, vinca alkaloids, your cardiovascular medication like digoxin, you know, verapamil, amiodarone. These can also cause that even abuse, you know, of certain drugs such as marijuana, big one, alcohol, big one, heroin, um, psychoactive drugs such as diazepam, antipsychotics, antidepressants, and then the list goes on. You know, HIV treatment such as your pros, TAs, inhibitors, 
um, you know, a metro, a clopromide, a phenotone, statins, the list just continues. But it's important to know etiology can be pharmacological, as we've mentioned. It can be idiopathic, physiological, or pathological. And therein, we are looking mainly at the um, balance between estrogen and testosterone. Um, so as you take your history, these are the things you are going to be looking at. You are going to look at those on history. And then when you now examine your patient, you then do your normal breast examination, um, looking at, you know, the level of the skin, which is the envelope, the nipple areola complex. Um, you want to see the parenchyma, um, the fat versus, you know, glandular predominance. Because if you look at it actually um, histologically, the, the, the degree of stromal and ductal proliferation um, is also quantified therein, where it can be florid, intermediate, or fibrous. Florid being an increased budding ducts and cellular stroma that they see. And this is usually gynecomastia that's early, present within the first four months. And then intermediate is now the overlap of the florid and the fibrous pattern. And then fibrous, of course, that's just excessive stroma of, you know, fibrosis. And there's minimal ductile proliferation. And these are generally seen in gynecomastias that is present for more than a year. So that's just a histological classification. But when we look at it um, clinically, we then want to now classify it um, based on the different classification systems that we have. Um, maybe I'll give you, let's see, I'll give you three classification systems or maybe four, but tell you the one that, you know, I generally use or we predominantly use, um, but there are others that exist you should know about. But Simon's classification um, generally is what um, I like to use and most of us would use to be able to determine the degree of tissue and skin excess because our management will then be guided in this manner. So Simon divides it into type 1, type 2, type 3. Type 1 um, being minor breast enlargement without skin excess. So just minor breast enlargement, but no skin excess. Type 2, we now have moderate breast in enlargement but we now break it into type 2A and type 2B. Type 2A, we've got this moderate breast enlargement. However, we do not have skin excess. Type 2B, we then have minor skin redundancy. So that's what separates that. So it's, 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 it's tissues that's enlarged moderately, but one, there's no skin excess. And then the other, we now start to see some skin redundancy there. And then type three, of course, as you can imagine, now we've got, you know, gross breast enlargement with excess skin, creating this, this pendulous breast, um, if you may. So that's the classification that I'll be happy. If you can grasp that, I'm good with that. There's a Webster classification, which is based on tissue type, the type of tissue, whether type 1 is glandular, type 2 fatty, and glandular mix, and then type 3, just simply fatty. Um, but that's one that's also used. Um, there's the Cordova and, you know, uh, Moschella, um, where it divides it into grade 1, 2, 3, and 4 as well. And this um, takes into account the different structural components of the breast. Um, and actually adds, um, you know, the relationship with the IMF and the NAC, um, telling you, look, if there's an increase in diameter and protuberance um, that's limited to the areola, it's grade one. Whereas the far extreme is hypertrophy of all components um, and an NAC greater than one centimeters below the IMF. So that's how they differentiate. Um, so choose which one you use. Or if um, also, um, you know, comes in with one and or it comes in grade one to grade five. And this is somehow a mix, um, you know, of also a histological component as grade one would be minimal hypertrophy, which is less than 250 grams with no ptosis. And then you'll say A or B. Either A, it's primarily glandular or B, fibrous. And then grade two, there's moderate hypertrophy. 
So grade one, we said less than 250. Grade two, we say 250 to 500, but also there's no tosis. A or B, primary glandular or primary fibrous. Grade three, there's severe hypertrophy. So it's not less than 250 as per grade one. It's not 250 to 500 as per grade two, but it's greater than 500 grams. And here, where we will divide it, it's now with ptosis. So it will say here we have grade one ptosis. Greater than 500 grams, but you've got grade one ptosis. And then grade five, I mean grade four, would be severe hypertrophy, as we've mentioned, which is similar to grade three. However, the ptosis would be grade two or grade three ptosis. So that's as per order. But I'm happy if you can get Simon, um, Simon's classification, we can easily then better manage a patient with that. Um, and we need not go further into, into staging. Now, how do we then manage a patient? We've spoken about it preoperatively. We do our, we check for the causes, the etiology, but we manage and we, or rather we investigate based on our history and what the history guides us. If you realize that there's issues with alcohol or liver, etc., then we're going to do liver function tests. Um, but we don't routinely just do hormonal tests for all the patients. We are guided by our history. So how do we manage these patients? Now, the way you would manage the patient is um, generally... I, I, I'm even going to say surgery. Of course, of course, remember before we go to surgery, you want to then have, um, you know, have a look at the patient, withdraw whatever drugs um, or, or pharmacological is issues may be there um, in order to then, to then manage the patient. But as per the indication of is for surgery, it would be, um, you know, a patient who's symptomatic. It would be an adolescent male with an enlargement that persists for more than 18 to 24 months. So if that gynecomasta that is present for, you know, is stable, generally I would say more than a year. If more than 12 months, it's stable, it's seldom going to ever regress. Another indication, of course, um, you know, it's kind of commercial of long duration. Why? Because it's leading to fibrosis. And then, of course, um, patients at risk of um, carcinoma, um, especially those with clan filters, might want to go for a subcutaneous mastectomy prophylactically. Okay, so how are we then going to manage the patient? All right, there's liposuction I want you to know about you know, either traditional or ultrasound assistant liposuction. Um, and 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 you, you just go through the different things, you know, the ba the basic tenets of ultrasound um, treatment, super wet infiltration or whatever. Um, but um, generally, you may find that it's not going to work, especially for your grade three and four. So how do we then make grade two and EB and three? So how do we then manage these patients? Now, I'm referring us back to our, um, our classification system. So, for grade one, remember we said it's just minor subareola enlargement, not so significant. The options there can be liposuction alone. Or others may say just a subareola, you know, if the sub areola excess, we can then do an excision there via perioreola incision. So that's for grade one. Grade two A, then you would then do liposuction, but plus minus, you know, others would say liposuction is enough because there's no skin redundancy, but I would say you must then have, um, a memory, you know, some weapons um, at your disposal and you may need a second areola incision um, to remove the, the excess tissue. And, and generally how we do that, um, you know, there are different techniques and incision um, that we can then use. But now when we go to grade 2B, what I would then advise, you look at your NAC position. 
Is it normal or it's not normal? What is the level of ptosis? What is my skin laxity? And then based on the level of excess skin um, and the level that I may want to shift an NAC, then I will then decide to do various excisions. Um, there are incisions such as the Omega incision that you can use um, and in that, you know, you it gives you um, room to extend lateral, laterally if you need more room to get more. So Omega works well. You can use an inferior bat wing incision if you just need to remove some excess skin. A perioreola or circum areola excision, you know, um, looking at the diameter and then making a periola is something that you can use. Note, if too tight, it may widen the NAC. So you've just got to do it properly and how you put in the sutures and how you maintain your pedicle are some of the things that are quite important. But now when we go to a grade three breast where there's too much excess, then now we need to look at other techniques that we can use. Generally, I like to use a vest over pants technique um but what you must know is that you need at least four centimeter a four centimeter skin bridge there and the advantage is is that it's good it addresses my parenchymal tissue i've got good access i'm able to remove um i'm able to address the nac and you know can elevate that and i can address the vertical excess skin which is super however the disadvantage um with your classic vest over pants is what is that it doesn't address the horizontal skin excess. And then you will see actually as you suture that you know you tend to have some left lateral deformity with, with closure as you close. Um, because that's that's one of the, the side effects. But there are ways actually how to just play around with your incisions. And then other techniques is your traditional uh, mammoplasty techniques. Um, but there may be a situation where no, 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 this is pendulous, this is too much, a severe grade three, and then this patient will require an amputation and a free nipple graft. And, 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 and I mean, if you've got such a situation, don't waste time. Just go ahead and do your amputation and your free nipple graft. And generally, actually, the results tend to be quite good. As I've mentioned, I'm not going to go into the non-operative, um, you know, causes. But, you know, once a pathological cause of gynecomastia has been excluded, um, some would say watch and wait is good um, and you would want to correct the underlying causes. And things such as, you know, anti-estrogen such as tamoxifen have been used, clomiphene, denazol, radiotherapy, some, you know, low-dose radiation has been used. Um, and has been found to be reduced, you know, the frequency thereof by some studies will say 50, 67 to 28 percent when using 12 to 15 grays. But generally, radiotherapy, you must just be careful um, because we know there are other effects um, therein. Um, but as long as you can define the goals that you want to go for, you can be able to then, um, you know, um, classify and then treat the patient accordingly, you should be then covered um, and be able to treat gynecomastia. What are the complications? Of course, early complications, you can have a hematoma. Therefore, we want to make sure we strip the patient. Um, you may have a seroma, you may have infections, you may have wound healing problems. You can lose your nipple, depending on the procedure that you use or compromise, but late um, complications, are things such as, you know, your under or over resection of tissue, depending um, how aggressive you were and what you use, you can have a, what we know as a saucer type deformity of the nipple areola complex. This is generally secondary to over resection of tissues. And then you may have scarring problems. And last but not least, of course, recurrence is an issue that's there. Um, and so those are the main issues that you may get. But if you look at them as per, you know, the excision, um, over resection, about 18%, post-scarring 18%, hematoma 16, seroma is something that comes in also quite highly and under resection, um, also coming in at 22% of the cases as found by Cotis. Um, but gynecomastia generally very common, classify it. 
well, exclude the, 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 the etiological factors that are correctable, um, give the adequate timeline, um, classify it, and manage as per the classification. And I hope with this we've given you enough information to be able to treat it irregardless of the classification where it falls in. I thank you for your attention and look forward to the next um, chat. Bye-bye.